joyful to be with you this morning, to look to God's Word together. If you'll grab your Bibles and turn with me to the letters of John, specifically 1 John. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back of the room. We'd love for you to grab that and become familiar with God's Word. I encourage you to bring your Bible. We like to preach from the ESV translation here at Disciples. As you look for 1 John, it's in the very back of your Bible, after 2 Peter and before Jude and Revelation. So you're right there towards the end. Uh, these letters of John are different than the Gospel of John that we see uh, earlier in the New Testament, whereby he testifies of the life of Christ. Um, these letters are, are pastoral encouragements and clarities that are needed for the, the church, and uh, we are blessed to get to study them still by God's providence. While you turn there, let me just speak briefly about our conviction here at Disciples Church to preach God's Word in an expositional way, which means the, it's the practice of drawing out of Scripture, out of God's Word, what it says about God and what it says to us. And this is in contrast to the ever-growing modern popular practice of eisegesis and which preachers impose their own thoughts or ideas or worldview onto the text. And uh, we just believe that God's Word is, is the power to change lives. And so my job is to speak it clearly, preach it with conviction, and get out of the way with the Holy Spirit do its work in your life. We've just finished a very long sermon series through Ephesians. It was a wonderful blessing. We're thankful to have you here with us as we dive in to the letters of John. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So whatever you're needing this morning, whatever you're struggling with, wherever you need to grow in life, the answers you're seeking, the understanding you need, the help and direction that will assist you is found in God's holy written word. It is sufficient through and through. Sitting around you is a plethora of people whose lives have been radically transformed, who are continually being sanctified. They've overcome addictions. Their marriages are healing. Their mismanagement of their life is, is being helped, is being counseled. And most importantly, their relationship with God is restored and secured in the gospel of Jesus Christ as testified in these pages of God's Word. I'm glad you're here today. I pray it's not just a one-time visit, but that we could get to know you. We could grow together in God's truths, that you would feel like family sooner than later. Let me say this. God is able, and His word and ways are best. So let's go to Him, humble, ready for all that He has for us today. Look with me at the passage of 1 John chapter 1, verse 5-7. through 7 says this, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. To jump right in, in this opening verse of our passage today, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. When Scripture says that God is light, it is not saying that God is the sun. Think about that. That is the false belief and idol worship of pagan gods by false religions. To, to worship something that God created as God is idolatry. The light of God is life. The light of God is illumination. The light of God is purity, holiness. 
The light of God is truth. One theologian said when thinking of God as light, God furnishes ethical direction and clarity of what is true. He illuminates the way. There are 139 references to light in the Old Testament. And in them we see some of the powerful references to the different workings of light according to God's providential decree. Maybe the first thing that comes to mind is what we read in the opening verses of Holy Scripture as God made physical light for creation. Genesis 1, 3-4, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God also provided His people with physical light, fire by night, for help and direction in their escape from slavery to Egypt. See this in Exodus 13. Later in prayer, King David speaks of God's spiritual light, which dispels spiritual darkness. 2 Samuel 22. Micah says, When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Micah 7, 8. Let me ask you a personal question. Do you feel that you're sitting in the darkness lately? Only the Lord can be the light you need to illuminate the lies and the deception and the darkness that is upon you. Isaiah has the most occurrences speaking of the light in the Old Testament with 29. And many of these are in reference to the promised Savior for mankind, Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to him in a moment. In James 1.17, we read, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. What does all this tell us about God? It tells us that God is high and exalted. He's worthy. And yet... He makes Himself known. He reveals Himself. He he brings illumination to us in common ways, by His common grace, and in many saving ways, by His saving grace. Understand with me that light in Scripture represents what is good and pure, what is true and what is holy The statement, God is light, means that God is perfectly these things. The Word of Truth Catechism gives us good clarity. Speaking of some of the attributes of God, in relationship to what we're saying here, a few reminders. All that God is and does is perfectly good. Have you ever had that moment where you consider questioning, God, what are you doing? All that God is and does is perfectly good. If there's air involved, it's with you, not with Him. And He alone is the final standard of good. How do I know what's good? I look to, I look to God. There is such an absolute perfection in God's nature and being that nothing is wanting to it or defective in Him, and nothing can be added to Him to make it better. Think of all the things that are defective, all the things that are incomplete or lacking in this life, all the things that are wicked or hurtful in this world. Oh, how we need God to be our light. There is just simply nothing that compares According to A.W. Pink, late great theologian, he says, He, God, is essentially good. Not only good, but goodness itself. The creature's good is a super added quality. In God, it is His essence. He is infinitely good. The creature's good is but a drop. But in God, there is an infinite ocean or gathering together of good. 
He is eternally and immutably good, for He cannot be less good than He is, as there can be no addition made to Him, so no subtraction from Him. God is also holy, which means God is distinct, separate in a class by Himself. He is set apart. He is superior to creation in every way, and above all, He is morally pure, without any sin, and He is holy in relation to every aspect of His nature and character. Purity and the sum of all moral excellency are found in Him. Let me ask you this morning, what are you using to attempt to help you find your way out of the darkness. Because nothing will do. Nothing will last. Nothing is better or more sufficient than God Himself. Everything else you're leaning on, everything else you're hoping for, clinging to, is insufficient or it will not last. Hear my plea this morning. Put down your homemade flashlights that represent the things you turn to to try to make a way. Put down the flickering candles that are your circumstances, that are, that are here and then there and then gone. Only God can illuminate your life now and forever in the most complete way. Hmm. God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Church, let that proclamation well up in us this morning with worship for Him. In this truth is the fact that the source of life is God. The source of truth is God. If there is any hope for any of us, we need the light that is God to completely and finally illuminate our lives and bring us into life with Him forever. To bring us into truth and out of the lies and the darkness. Oh, we need this because we are so lost in the darkness. In the dark, good and evil look alike. In the light, they are clearly distinguished. In the dark, the wrong ways look like the right ways, and the right ways look like the wrong ways. Just as darkness cannot exist in the presence of light, sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. All of the lights that we lean on to try to find our way fall short, only God is sufficient. Only when the light of God shines is there true life and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is John's point in the opening words of his gospel. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That reference to the Word is Jesus. We talked about this last week. And the Word was God. Jesus, eternally God the Son. He is in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. The emphasis of John here is saying that the darkness cannot overpower the light of God. Just as darkness cannot over, overcome or overpower light. Light always overcomes darkness. Darkness is always conquered by the light that shines in its presence. If you were to go into a pitch black isolated room and light a candle, the light would overpower the darkness. The life of God, the life of of the eternal one. Jesus comes into the world as true light and he lights up the lives of many. Many who have only known lostness 
and deception and sin and darkness. The enemy has tried for so long in so many ways to overcome the light of God, and yet he never wins. You go to Luke twenty two fifty three. Jesus refers to the powers of darkness encroaching on him in his last hours before the cross. He says, this is the hour of the power of darkness. In other words, this is when Satan and his demons are going to throw everything they got at me. But I bring you good news today. Demon darkness cannot overpower the light of God. Think about all the ways that Satan tried to destroy the messianic line of Christ all of those generations. Satan tried to kill all the babies at the time of the birth of of the promised Messiah just to try to get to Jesus. The demons came after Jesus again and again as he walked the roads and taught and healed. Satan himself comes to him with great temptation to try to get him to bow down, to violate God's word. Satan does everything he can in the garden to try to get him to go the other direction, away from the will of the Father and the sacrifice of the cross for his people. Satan thinks he's won when Jesus is murdered on the cross. But there is good news. The darkness, all the demon darkness, all the forces of sin and wickedness and all their accompanying human evil cannot shut out the light. Amen? God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The problem is, as clear as light and darkness are, there are many who are deceived. Many who think they know the light from the darkness, but they prove to only know the darkness. Because they call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness. That's Isaiah 5.20. One of the great signs that you are caught up in the darkness is when you call what God calls good, bad. Or what God calls bad, good. This is not the truth. This is deception. This is the darkness at work. For many, they think they know God. They've they've grown up with religion. They've they've studied the Word of God. They, They think they're good with God. And have fellowship with Him. But they don't truly know God if their walk is in the darkness. That to say you know God and to walk in the darkness, John is saying is a lie. It's to not practice the truth. This is John's sobering clarity in verse 6. Look with me. 1 John 1, 6. If we say we have fellowship with Him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Intellectually, light is truth and darkness is deception or ignorance. Morally, light is purity, it's righteousness, and darkness is evil. Remember, I said earlier that we'll get back to the promised Redeemer, the Christ. The one whom God would send, the only one who can free us from the darkness and bring us into the light. Listen to his words, Jesus' words, in John 12, 46. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in the darkness his words here is not just believe about him scripture is clear to say that even the demons believed rightly that jesus was the son of god you can't just believe about him that's insufficient clearly the demons are damned now the belief that saves is a belief into Him. You trust your life into Him. You don't look to do it your way anymore. You do it His way. You surrender yourself to Him. That's faith. That's trust in Jesus. 
I've come into the world as light. Whoever believes into me may not remain in the darkness. The, the negative side of what Jesus is saying here is whoever does not believe into him remains in the darkness. Referring to the reality of our sin. Our sin means we're in death. We're in darkness. The unregenerate person, the person who's not saved, the person who's still Lord of their own lives, no matter how much religion you might have, you still belong to yourself. You've not trusted yourself to Jesus. Unregenerate people are darkened in their understanding, Ephesians 4.18 says. They're alienated from life with God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Their hearts are hard. They they don't have that childlike, sweet surrender to Jesus. Mankind, apart from new life in Jesus, is darkened because the light, spiritual life, is not in them. Their heart, therefore, is hard. It's not given new spiritual life yet. This is total depravity. It's a state of being spiritually dead. It's not just that some parts are sinful and other parts are pure. Every part of our being, in the, when apart from Christ and living on our own in the darkness, is affected by our sin. Our intellects, our emotions, our desires, our heart, our goals, our motives, even our physical bodies, it's all affected. It's all enslaved. It's all tainted by sin. If you're struggling with these things, you have an illumination issue. You have a faith in Christ issue. Without Christ illuminating light, we're left to our corruption and darkness. And and this is not just bad for this momentary life, but it's really bad. It's the worst for our eternal life. Existence. John 3.36 Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. There's a trust in him, a believing into him. And notice the extra clarity Jesus gives here is there's an obedience. There's a testimony that I belong to Jesus, therefore I do this life his way. If you can hear my voice, I pray that you understand the weight of the final verdict. That the wrath of God remains on the person who's apart from Christ. There's no going back. There's no trying again when you die. It's the final and greatest sense of the word final ever used. And it's forever. Sure, the way of the world, the desires of your flesh seem like fun now. They seem like they're best now. But at what cost? What are you throwing away to chase these things? Scripture is clear that it at best is the cost of eternity. What a cost! The problem is left to ourselves. Our sin loves the dark. It doesn't like being exposed to the light. It cringes at the idea. So I ask you just to do some personal inventory. Are you struggling to obey the Lord, church? To call His ways good? See that your issue is a faith issue. It's a clinging to the longings of the flesh. It's a clean to the darkness instead of to Christ. You have to see that in your sin, apart from Christ, you're addicted to yourself. All you can think about is you. What you want. What you don't have. What you think you deserve. In this, your default is not to die to self. And trust Jesus. You don't humble yourself and obey God even when it's hard. You do what you want to do. 
We must see how desperate we are to see Jesus and to trust in Him. To be our Savior and our Lord. You need to literally stop reaching for answers in the darkness. Stop drinking in the darkness thinking it's going to help. And reach for Christ alone. Who is the light. Drink in the light. That is Christ. Only in Christ do we know the light. Do we embrace the light. And do we walk in the light. There's nothing more central, nothing more important than this. Until you address this, all of your doing is just shuffling the pieces on the board in the dark. And when you come to the light, it is that game changing. The problem is there's another layer of deception that plagues many who are outside the church, and sadly, some who are even in the church. So lean in, church family. This very well could be exactly where you're at and what you're struggling with. By God's providence, you would hear His Word. The false teachers of that day, and still many today, hold to a belief that you can know God, be on good terms with God, and yet still live in unrepentant sin. But God's word is clear, 2 Corinthians 6.14, what fellowship has light with darkness? The simple truth is to live in the darkness is to live outside of the revelation of God's character and will. They cannot blend. You cannot be doing both. To try to do both is to lie. It's to not testify the truth. It's to testify a lie. Jesus said so clearly, Luke 16, 13, No servant can serve two masters. For he will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. So those who claim Christ, those who claim they're good with God while they walk in unrepentant sin or while they do things their way instead of God's way are deceived. And God's Word says that they are liars. John says here they do not practice the truth. Sadly, all too many have convinced themselves that they're good. They have so-called faith in God or mental assent to the truths of God or Scripture but they live according to their flesh. They stand their ground on what seems right to them or what feels right to them instead of what God says is right. Oh, how sobering and sad it is when those who claim to know God prove to only trust in the darkness. Scripture is clear this is happening in Scripture time, and we know it's happening today. People who look to be of us prove not to be. Oh, how the longing of my heart is that real repentance, real faith would go to work to circle back. That real humility would draw us together in Christ. It's so hard to see, even as of late, some come be part of the church, experience growth and love and Wonderful things on on levels they never have. There's a perception of a testimony of belonging to God. And then just a radical turn away. The latest testimony of one of those brothers, we're going to share with you some more updates soon, is uh, someone who came out of a lot of hard, hard stuff. A lot of time in prison and is back on the streets, is back to drugs. Brothers and sisters, I'm pleading with, look to Christ. Don't turn to the flesh. What we must see is the false testimony to claim to be something they're not. 
John is clear to speak of the sad reality. In John 3, 3 19 through 21, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. When we belong to God, we don't need to hide. We don't need to tuck in. We don't need to put a mask on it. We don't need to avoid. We want to be in the light. We want the testimony of God at work in us to go to work. We want Him to get the glory, not me. Walking in the light involves a true willingness, a complete surrender to serve and obey God, while walking in the darkness essentially reveals a refusal to submit to and trust in Christ, but instead follow what your flesh wants or thinks it needs. This is why true Christians will never reject accountability. They will practice repentance when sin is revealed. For while they, we do still sin, we belong to God through Christ, and therefore we live in the light, so sin is exposed. I want nothing to do with it. Whereas the deceived person thinks they're good with God, continues to pursue their own way, continues to walk in sin without repentance, proves to belong to the darkness, for they love and seek the things that are fleshly. They don't want exposure. They don't want truth. See the powerful testimony, the work of the Lord today, just to either cling or reject truth. Church, there is a simple and essential evaluation we must make of ourselves, of others. If they claim to know God and trust Christ, are they walking in the light? Those who are truly in the light know God and trust Him. They believe His ways are best. They do not go after their own ways. They humble themselves to do God's way. Remember the words with me of Paul in chapter 5 of Ephesians. We were there not long ago. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Oh, what a joy it is to see the testimony of so many of you do this work. To lean in, to say, let's go. Know me and love me and walk with me. I want to glorify God. I don't want secrets. I don't want hidden addiction. I want want to be sanctified. I want to glorify Him with my days. I want those around me and those coming up behind me, my children, to see the light of Christ. Paul says to not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness. Why? Because the unfruitful works of darkness are evil. They're wicked things that spring up from sin and Satan. One theologian, John Gill, wrote, Fellowship is not to be maintained with the works of darkness, which are sins, because they are opposite to the light, to the light of nature, to the light of the divine word, both the law and the gospel, to the light of grace, to God, the fountain of light, to Christ, the light of the world. The works of darkness are unfruitful because good fruit is what honors God. God honoring fruit is what grows from a tree that is healthy and living, not a tree that is dead. Matthew 7 17 through 20. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Church, if we belong to Christ, if we are grafted into the vine, then we cannot 
also be given to the darkness. Even, if, even when you're struggling, even in the midst of that struggle, the words that, that bubble up out of your mouth, the longing of those hardest moments are still for the Lord, the glory of the Lord, love me enough to not leave me here, love me enough to point me to truth. That's the speaking of the person who belongs to Jesus. Not leave me alone, not let me go my own way, not making excuses. No, let me cling to Jesus. Help me cling to Jesus, even when you're struggling. It's not enough to avoid unfruitful works of darkness. We're to expose them, it says. Why? So that others don't fall prey. So that unfruitful works of darkness are seen as wicked as they should be instead of being celebrated. So that the testimony of the gospel is not tainted. We look to the last part of verse 6. We see that John's emphasis here is less about defining what walking in the light and the darkness are and more about the reality of the consequences of walking in the darkness, especially for those who claim to know God. Look with me again. If, If we say we have fellowship with Him, While we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. There are two offenses stated here. Lying about our relationship with God and not doing what truly honors God. There is no fellowship between light and darkness. So if we're living in the darkness, but claiming to belong to the light, we are lying. Our testimony is a lie. You cannot claim to know God and live in ways that are against Him and His commands. God's Word is so clear that while we who truly know Christ will struggle, we won't give in to the flesh. We won't give ourselves over to sinful things. We won't give up on fighting for what honors God. The struggle is real, but the fight remains. The, the, the humble submission to be led by the Word, by the Spirit, remains. Desperation. I can't do this on my own. I need Christ. Why? Why does the true Christian do this? Because the Lord is my joy now. The Lord is my truth. Not my feelings, not my passions, not my circumstances. To say Jesus is Lord, to say you have fellowship with God, and then to walk unaccountably, unrepentantly in sin, is to lie about your standing with God. Jesus said it clearly in Matthew 7, 16. You will know them by their fruit. You you can't say, I know it looks bad, but God knows my heart. If you really slow down and think about that statement in light of who God really is, that's a very damning statement. That's not a liberating statement, as many think it is. I'm claiming on my own, I'm good with God. That's not what His Word says. His Word says, "He, He knows your heart. Yes, that's true. He sees the deception that you're baking. And he calls it foul. He doesn't see around it, see the little prop you're putting up, and go, oh yeah, okay, we're good. Uh, Especially not God, right? God knows your heart. And Scripture is clear that if you truly belong to Him, you will repent when you're in sin, Turn to honor Him instead of making excuses, trying to press the blame onto others, or just ignoring the problem. This is real. This must be heard and tended to today. May the Gospel illuminate and bring life, bring motivation We must not lie. We must do what is true. If we truly belong to God, we will tell the truth about God and who He is and what Christ has done to save us 
in how we live our lives. It's not perfection. None of this, only Christ did this perfectly. We are desperate for Him. It's the beauty of the gospel. It's not about religious works. It's not about heavy weights. It's about a desperation for Jesus to be your rock, Jesus to be your Savior, Jesus to be your Lord, and then to move through you, to change your motivations, to change your, your longings, to change your convictions, to go to work in your priorities. But let's, let's slow to evaluate. Christian, in what ways are you potentially guilty of not walking in the light? but walking in the darkness. In what ways are you rejecting God, His Word, those He's put over you to lead you? In what ways are you practicing sin? In what ways are you staying upset, not forgiving another, looking to something in your circumstances or in creation to satisfy you? These are things we must confess and address. To look to the power of Christ and to do it for the glory of God. Can I just say lovingly, don't do this alone. God has blessed you with a church to walk this road together. One of the greatest ways you remain deceived or stuck in the darkness is to keep it to yourself. No, invite in trusted, blood-bought family who will love you enough to speak truth into your life. For those of you visiting today, my, my press for you is to commit to getting plugged into a solid Bible teaching church. A church that is convinced and committed to doing church God's way and not tradition's way. A place where you can be known and loved and led. Don't go at it alone. Every day your pride or your fear of man causes you to keep it to yourself is a day you remain stuck and in many times worse, a day you slip in the wrong direction. It's a day that you hold up the lie. If you belong to Christ, don't hold up the lie. Step into the light and let the Lord go to work. With that, let's look to John's proclamation of what it should be for those who truly know God and trust their lives to Christ. 1 John 1, seven. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise God that the gospel brings us out of the darkness and into the light of Christ. Isaiah 9, 2, The people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. John 8, 12, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is clear to say that those who follow him, again, those who trust him, walk by faith in him, do not walk in the darkness, but have and enjoy the light that is life. We don't just know the truth, we do it. Just as we are, we don't just see the light, we walk in it. Notice John says in verse 6, walk in darkness, and then in verse 7 he says, walk in the light. In this, he's calling his fellow Christians to action by using the word walk. Not just any action, though. The right kind of action. An action, the action or the kind of living that honors God and not the flesh. Do you remember Paul's words in Ephesians 4, 17, when he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. And then later in chapter 5, verse 2 of Ephesians, Paul said, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, 
a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The Holy Scriptures have charged the people of God to be attentive to how we walk. This has been said from the beginning. Deuteronomy, consider how far back Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. Chapter 8, verse 6. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and fearing Him. Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, looking to secular friends or family or business associates who don't belong to Christ. The man who's blessed doesn't walk in their counsel, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Christian, are you rightly fearing God? Are you rightly trusting God? Or are you getting caught up in what might happen and how things are not going the way you want them to? And so you're overly fixed on the circumstances and it's breaking you down. Delight in his law. Day and night, meditate on it. Be blessed. He goes on to say it will, it will grow you deep roots so the wind and the storm won't blow you over. Here's the thing John's driving home. We are to reveal the work of the Lord in our lives by walking, talking, living out what God has done and what he's doing. The light that He's shown in our lives is to illuminate out of us. Understand it is not Him and now it's us. It is Him at work in and through us. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light. So I just want to ask you, how are you walking? How are you living? What are you doing with these days as of late that God is graciously giving to you? That He's giving to you not for you, but for Him. For others who are watching. If there are areas you're struggling with, if you're feeling tempted to reject God's Word or God's way, if you're feeling tempted to walk in the darkness rather than light, my encouragement is go to God's Word. As the psalmist says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. Christian parents, church, we spent a lot of time speaking these truths to the little ones He's put around us this week. Are you just telling them these things? Or are you showing them what it looks like to walk in the light? To let His Word light your path? I encourage you to remember, you're not alone. God is with you. Isaiah 42, 6-8 I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for my people a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon from the prisons those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other nor my praise to carved idols. I encourage you not to look to immature people unbelievers for counsel, they will only feed you lies. They will only ramp up the deception of your flesh. Their counsel will only be what serves the flesh. For it's all they know. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership is righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship is light with darkness? 
Church, God is light. The light is not just moral goodness. It is God. It is his revelation of his holiness. We are to walk in God, to abide in Christ. Now that we've received Christ, we are to put on Christ and be who we are now in him. Another false belief that many believed and still perpetuate today is to say that you can have true fellowship with God, but then reject true fellowship with other Christians. Understand, this is yet another form of walking in darkness. It's another deception, for it stands against the clear teaching of Scripture. True life with God means being shaped by Him and living out the life He's called us to. Jesus said clearly, John 13, 35, By this, watch, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John is going to say later in 1 John 2, 9, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Some of you are going, but I have deep hurts and unforgiveness. Some of it's maybe a lifetime worth. How? How how would I do that authentically? And I'll just tell you, if you're new to these things, the power of the gospel at work in you, the power of the forgiveness you receive from the holy God through Christ is the motivating power for you to forgive others who for a lifetime you have been weighed down by carrying their sin. It's one of the greatest things the gospel does in our lives as it goes to work. And the freedom you begin to experience as you forgive others is amazing. People will look to you and say, who are you? (laughs) If you have unresolved conflict, hatred, unforgiveness, your problem is not them. Your problem is not your circumstances. Your problem is not your performance. Your problem is darkness. If you're still walking in the darkness, the only answer for you is the light of Christ. 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Talked about this last week. Fellowship is not just being together. It is a true bond of love and unity. It is so special that only those in the body of Christ, those who are in the light, can have it and really enjoy it. It is a major part of our testimony in Christ because it is so different than how the lost world and lost people experienced unity and togetherness. It is such a sweet part of life in Christ to truly belong to the church. People who who love you, not for what you do for them, but for who you are in Christ. Christian, if you are truly walking in the light, that is God. Hear me, you will not have ill feelings, unresolved hurts, grudges with another. Ephesians 4.3 is so clear. You will make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This means the light of Christ at work in you will not allow division. You will humbly humble yourself. You will seek counsel. You will forgive and pursue peace at all costs. For this is what honors the Lord. This is what makes the testimony of who He is and His work in and through us true. I've heard some people say, some people who profess Christ say, I just can't do it with this person anymore. Hear me, that is your flesh talking, not Christ in you. That is not the evidence of one who is living in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We will love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. 
Now, John also emphasizes here as we begin to close that walking the light not only means a testimony of real and ongoing fellowship with one another, but also means the evidence of the full and complete forgiveness of our sins. We're really going to go deeper into this next week, but I want to, I want to grab it here in verse 7. I want to speak to it before we go. Jesus is the cause of our forgiveness. For we would not be forgiven if not for His sacrifice in our place. The sacrifice of His shed blood is the only worthy ransom for a lifetime of sin before the holy standard of God. We are forgiven for all our sins, past, present, and future. Nothing that Jesus did on the cross somehow missed some. If you think that way, you're thinking wrongly about the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing God. (laughs) He didn't miss any. It was finished on the cross. Walking in the light doesn't mean it earns Jesus' ongoing atonement for our sins, but it is evidence that all of our sins are forgiven, paid for by His blood. To not walk in the light, but instead to walk in the darkness, is evidence that your sins are not forgiven. They weren't forgiven, even though you claim to know God or trust God. This is a weighty but important truth. Many who claim to be good with God then make excuses to go on in unrepentant sin. And so here he's saying, you're not just lying. You're outside of true forgiveness that comes with those who truly surrender your life to Christ. Again, we'll dive into these important aspects of forgiveness next week. What a passage is coming. Let me bring us full circle to the opening words of verse 5 this morning. John says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. The message is the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on behalf of undeserving sinners. Jesus said it so well, John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in the darkness. And so I ask you this morning, what is your honest testimony? Not not the one you put out there for everyone to hopefully see and believe. Your honest testimony. Do you belong to Jesus? And therefore you live in the light and you do not walk in the darkness. Or are you guilty of claiming to know Jesus? Maybe for a time you even served, you, you were involved. But in the end you proved to not honor Him or obey Him while you call His ways good, you Live unto your own ways. If this is you, repent and believe. It it doesn't have to be done today. It can begin today. Confession without excuse to call sin, sin. To trust Jesus. To invite in brothers and sisters to love you and walk with you in a way that helps you to cling to Him and enjoy Him and serve Him and walk in the light, it can begin today. But you will only move from the place you're in with the true and full Holy Spirit empowered conviction to see your sin and confess it as such. You must no longer blame shift or make excuses. No, the Spirit must bring conviction and give you a longing to abide and serve Jesus, your Master. Oh, what a day this is for many whom God transforms. Many who are in the church and have been for a long time, but have been missing true life in Christ. One of my favorite testimonies from many here at Disciples over the years is people who have been in the church but have not known the fullness of the gospel at work, and faith goes to work in a whole new way. Some of you have heard that testimony. You've watched it. And yet today, it's for you. Oh, how I pray you see your need for Christ alone to save you from yourself, to surrender, to obey Him. 
He would flood your life with light. Some of you have never truly known Jesus as Lord and Savior. You never claim that. Maybe you've attended church. Maybe you even served in the church, but, but, but still have not claimed life in Christ. If God is illuminating your heart and mind to see and savor what Jesus has done, that you would confess your sin and trust your life to Jesus, new life is happening. Salvation. Repent and believe and be saved. We'd love to join you in this journey, to hear that testimony from you, begin to walk with you. Jesus said in John 12, 36, Believe in the light while you have the light, that you may become sons of the light. This is a sobering way for him to say, you may not have tomorrow. What is the business you need to do with him today? If you were lost in the darkness, hear me clearly. No amount of self-help, circumstantial changes, fixes this most important problem of guilt and sin. If you are truly alive in Christ, therefore in the light of God, then let's hold fast to his word. Be led by his spirit. Walk together in deep fellowship so that we remain in the light and testify who Christ really is and what he's doing for many. Amen? Pray with me. Lord, you are good. Lord, what a, what a joy it is to come to your holy word and just to look to it with submission, to, to say, Lord, don't leave me the way I came in. Don't help me to loosen my grip on the things I've clung to for, for a false identity the, the creation I've clung to to bring me joy, but that instead my joy would be in you, my identity would be in you. Illuminate our lives with the light of Christ so we're no longer enslaved to the darkness. Yes, we still walk in the valley of the shadow of death, but may we walk in the light of Christ, the bright testimony for those you put around us for your glory and your gospel to go to work. It is by your grace we are saved. Do your work in us now as we celebrate in song, respond, prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.